The anticipation is killing me. Hi, everybody. It's the book, book Curious Bibliophiles again, back for our third episode. Um, before I hand the reins over to Christine, Christine, say hi. Hey. Um, I want to throw a big, big thank you out to um, Mr. Matheru for not only watching, but liking and subscribing and commenting on our second episode where we reviewed his book, The Novice. Um, so thank you so, so much. That was absolutely amazing for all of us. We were definitely, definitely very happy. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, and Lisa Gardner, if by some chance you're watching this, please know that I love all of your books and I just want you to like something, please. Oh, you're sounding desperate, honey. I am desperate. I love Lisa Gardner. <laughs> um, okay, uh, that being said, our third book was Girl Interrupted by Susanna Kaysen, and it was Christine's Choice. So this is where you take over, hon. Hey. All right. So... Yeah, I picked Girl Interrupted, and it is basically just the ramblings of a crazy human while they're in an institution, and kind of you learn a little bit about mental disorder and how it you function. I don't know. It's I thought it was a good book. I liked it. It was a very interesting read. I feel like I learned things. I feel sometimes it was hard to like keep like steady because obviously I'm semi sane. So, like, <laughs> you know, she would jump all over the place. I'm like, wait, 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 what is, what did you just say? But other than that, I don't know. I thought it was a, it was an interesting read. That's for sure. Kevin? I would agree on basically all of that. It was, uh, it was interesting. I, uh, I was uh, kind of wary going into it because I kind of always had this viewpoint that uh, everyone's, basically everyone is crazy in their own sense and really it's kind of a relative thought and basically anyone could end up there at any point in time kind of deal and the this book basically is like a reiteration of those those thoughts i thought Anyways. yeah i agree with that Lila? um so i had read this book once before um, before I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And um, so reading it now is, is interesting just because I've never been institutionalized. It has been suggested, but <laughs> I never took them up on it. Um, <laughs> just because I was like, you know what? The accommodations may not be to my liking. Um, I've read Girl Interrupted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, so I know a couple of people who have also been institutionalized and their um, stories are fairly similar about how being there is actually, you know, can actually be more detrimental to your mental health because you're surrounded by people who have their own problems and then you become attached to them and their stories. And um, one thing that really resonated with me was the whole idea of having a whole bunch of people telling you how you feel or yeah. like telling you what's going wrong with you um, without understanding exactly what you're going through. So like the doctors and the nurses, the way that they interact with the patients, um, I definitely understand like the feeling of frustration of like, okay, you understand the science of things, but you aren't really looking at me as a total human being. You're just looking at my condition um, and really everyone has some sort of disorder, some sort of abnormality about them. But if you analyze every single person and every single thing that they do, you're going to find something. Um, so what, where does the line go where it's abnormal versus like normally abnormal <laughs> behavior? Um, which is something that I've like, the line has often been crossed where I'm like, you know what? I don't have an eating disorder. I just am lazy. I don't want to eat right now. <laughs> or like, <laughs> I just like, I, you know, I, I don't think that I'm sad because I need more medication. I just feel like, you know, my grandma died and like, <laughs> this is normal. <laughs> and, and, um, 
so it's like interesting because you get into that system, it's so hard to get out of it because you have people now who are kind of studying you like a lab rat. Um, and the intensity is kind of scary because they start telling you what's wrong with you and then you start believing that there's right. something fundamentally wrong with you. When you're already arguing with yourself about it. <laughs> right, about like, and, it, and then it screws up your sense of reality of like, well, maybe I'm more crazy than I think I am because these people are telling me that I have all these problems and like, how far should I go with it? How many medications do I need to take? You know, how many people do I need to see about how many different problems that I allegedly have? So um, that's the part of this book that really resonated with me because I'm kind of in the middle of it now. And so being a part of it um, in a way is, it's just kind of like I've spent a couple of parts in the book just kind of nodding my head and being like, yep. <laughs> Yeah, no, I feel that. I definitely do. So, um, you know, and I think that being a little older now, because the first time I read it, I was a teenager. And I, it, I was definitely reading it from the perspective of, like, oh, nobody gets me. <laughs> you know, like, well, I'm a teenager. Yeah. But now I have a little bit more perspective, especially since I've been through what I've been through. And it made the read a lot more meaningful this time around. Aww. Yay! <laughs> I'm glad that you were so connected with it. That's super great. I, I'm that makes me really happy because I really was so excited to read this book, and I was like, nobody's gonna even like it. Everybody's gonna think I'm insane. Great. <laughs> You're gonna think I need to be thrown away. <laughs> That's my worry. <laughs> no, that was Oh my god. Why did I suggest this book? I could have just picked a normal book like a normal human. But I read it and it was great and I was I'm really happy I read it. So Aaron? Thoughts? Now I feel really bad. Oh you hated it. I no, I didn't hate it. I think my disconnect was it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I thought there was going to be a lot more science behind it, not necessarily her inner turmoil, whether, you know, trying to prove herself basically not crazy rather than, you know, I just, I don't know. I guess I thought there was going to be a lot more look into an actual mental hospital. I, I wanted to know basically what actually went on, you know, the, the actual issues and things like that, not. Right. Which is I, where I don't know. Into, like kind of an issue when it's like a memoir or diary like that is kind of, because it's her perspective of it. Like she exactly painting the best picture she could, but she also was like, she was the one in there. Right? Yeah. You know, she, the, these things were happening to her. Right, and she, was on, she wasn't super stable. She, all these people were checking on her, telling her what she felt, what she needed to do, when she needed to do it, if she was walking too fast or too excited about something. Like, I don't know. So it's, I, I don't know. You got it You got it in weird spots. Like, just randomly, she was like, oh, sometimes people stay and be nurses, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like, I liked it. So I, I don't want you to think that I didn't. I just... Oh, yeah. This definitely isn't the kind of book that I generally read. I, I read very, very few biographies and memoirs and things like that. Um, and they're usually, as weird as this sounds, like true crime things. Uh -huh. So like Tracy Dugard, I read her uh, yeah. her biography and things like that. Yep. This, this was definitely, I don't know, it was intense and... I didn't necessarily look at it as like how Lila described. You know, she, she had a personal connection to it. I didn't even I didn't even connect anything like that. I just kinda I don't know. Just kinda read it and was like, hmm. All right. You were like that. I definitely understand the, the criticism there. And I would also um, if you're interested in this topic, but need something that's a little more co cohesive 
And if you haven't read it yet, I would recommend One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, I own it. Yeah. I may ask you to be. borrow that because I haven't read it. I, yeah. Yeah, it's it. I have to take breaks from it. It's pretty. It's that good. Sounds familiar. It's I very know good. I haven't read it. I haven't read it. It's it's like a classic it's, read. It could have been on your school to read list or something. Yeah, like, like it's up there with like To Kill a Mockingbird, things like that. I think we might have. Yeah, we probably yeah. Miss Bain. Maybe. Did you have? It, it sounds really yeah, I did, but it sounds really right. familiar. <laughs> remember it though. <laughs> well it's a good book and it's it's um from the perspective of one guy but it's a little more all encompassing. Yeah. Yeah, there's a movie about it too, doesn't um there is a movie and um oh my god, how am I blanking on IMD to the res IMDB to the rescue. Alright, well while you're doing that let's continue about the book. Um, what talking points did anybody have? Did anybody have something special? Ah, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. That's okay. I liked it. I have a sticky note. All right, Aaron. What's the, what did what is your most prominent memory of the book? Um, the very weird feeling I got when she referenced um her teacher. And I was like, why was she thinking of her high school teacher and that he was going to come visit? And then I got to the end, I was like, ah. Yeah, because. They, they had a thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it was one of those things. And actually, if you read my uh, my sticky note, it says. Nobody can see them but you, honey. I, I know. It says, why would she think of her high school teacher? And then, never mind, they fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Legit, I went back and I was just like, never mind. Just ignore this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was definitely like my my one big holy crap. Why would you think of that? I don't know why. It just was really weird to me. Um, I, mean, I don't know. I had a high school teacher that I thought was pretty banging. I'm not gonna lie. I know who it is though. Who is it, Mr. Cassidy? It was Cassidy. No, no, I hate that guy. I hate no, you don't. You love Cassidy. Come no, on. okay, because no, here's what happened. He was very hot, and then I got assigned his class, and I sat in front, and I had all my pencils, and I was so excited. And I was like, hell yeah, hot teacher, let's do this. And then he was fucking terrible, awful, worst human being. I hate that guy. Okay, then who was it? It was Mr. Gembis, my uh, ninth grade math teacher. He was only what there for like. Mr. Years. Gembis. What? Mr. Gambis, he was the ninth grade math teacher. And he was beautiful and he played guitar and he had tattoos and his teeth were perfect. I don't think he exists because I don't ever remember that name. I like, promise you he exists. I was in the class with Sarah Feltenbarger and Courtney Broccoli and Courtney Rice. Okay. Two of those names I don't think exist anymore, so. <laughs> no, well, I know the Courtney's still exist. I don't know about. No, I don't know if she's out there anyway. I don't. I just don't think I've never heard that name before. And well, I probably shouldn't have said their last names. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, right. so yeah. The other thing I had was I um. <laughs> what was it the uh, how she discredits her psychiatrist? Yeah. How when he takes her to, you know, get admitted and everything and he tells one story on how oh no it happened at this time and then she shows her admission form of like no like right. i was admitted at 11 30 and i was literally at your office you had me sit there for two hours before you know the taxi came up and i literally was only in there uh having like a a little powwow with you for 15 minutes before you decided this bitch crazy right so I, I thought that was pretty pretty neat that she actually had proof that, you know, yeah. to discredit I, him. I liked going through her inner brain workings of it. Like, okay, well, I was here for this time, and it was I was there for maybe 20 minutes to 30 minutes maximum. There's no way that it was any more than that. And then you can check it by this here, and I sent this text message, or I, no, not obviously not text message, but, you know, you call that this person at this time, that's the call log. Like, I don't know. It was good. I liked watching her brain Go. Break it down. Yeah. yeah. It's because it's gaslighting. It's like telling someone one thing that's not true, and you're like, 
yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, it really is. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, fuck, is it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> especially if someone who's a figure of authority, and especially in a situation where it's possible that someone has a warped view of reality, you can very easily play with that person. Right. It's very easy to just be like, no, you were here for two hours. Was I? <laughs> like, uh oh. <laughs> no, I just, I thought that was really cool that she knew she wasn't crazy per se, but she was able to actually prove that. And I mean, it still didn't matter. They, they still admitted her and, and kept her in there for two years, but. Right, like where she touches on at the end where she goes over exactly what they diagnosed her with, which is the personality disorder. And yeah. It's just basically like if you paid that close attention to any person at all, everyone qualifies for that. Like it's just like being indecisive. Like I don't know what I want for dinner every day. How do you even decide? Like is that a problem? Should I know? <laughs> I felt you looking at me. You know, like, I don't know. I liked it. That's all I know. <laughs> I can tell you that. It was really great. I really liked, I really, really liked, like, Lisa. I liked Lisa a lot. What did everybody else think of Lisa? Lisa was the, uh, sociopath. Yeah. Yeah, this, yep. The Too one bad. that got into the fight, uh, or not fight, but basically like, like the territorial, other. yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, she's, she, I like, uh, I like someone that you can't really predict a whole ton, I guess. And you can't, y yes, hi, Kevin. <laughs> I, but, I, know, I like, wild card. Wild card. Yeah, I, I, I like when, that a lot. That I like, I like when the other time. Lisa got sent to maximum security. And to get them out, she just, like, lights up a cigarette. Yeah. And, like, all of a sudden, all the all the nurses come swarming, and they're like, right. dude, we've been standing here for, like, 15 to 20 minutes, and now all of a sudden, because I'm smoking, you're going to let us out? Right. Yeah, she's, she's like, I'm just going to do whatever I have to do to get what I want to happen, and I don't really give, I don't care if it affects you, really. I'm sorry if you don't love it, but. And I'm just going to leave. Like, yeah. I'm just going to leave? And yep. then come back when I'm ready in three or four days. It's just like, okay, well, I got my dose of outside. I'm ready to be taken care of now. Like a cat that, like, gets out at night or something. And then a couple days later, they're like, ah. Uh, they're pulling at the door? door? Yeah. They're like, just kidding. Can I curl up next to the fireplace again? Yeah. <laughs> Which they do describe. In that book, she does touch on where she says, like, the outside world is almost too hard to deal with once you've lived inside the padded cell of like the mental institution. She, she, they do everything for you. You don't have to think about what food you're going to make. You don't have to think about getting dressed in the morning where you need to go. You don't have to think about getting a job. You don't have to like nothing or bills to pay. Like everything is taken care of for you in there, mm -hmm. which take, which also kind of takes away at your own personal like self worth though. It's like a vicious cycle. Like no matter where you go, every if once you're in there, people are just going to continuously find things that are wrong. But they're the ones perpetuating it because we are still individuals, no matter what. And we don't. We need to be able to be that without someone's watchful eye every single second. Well, you lose your dignity. Yeah. Nothing is off limits, and no part of your behavior isn't scrutinized or controlled um, and it's not just that people are giving you their opinion it's that their rule is law yeah. like if you cause a problem you go into max security or you go into the room for people who are causing a problem and you get locked in there <laughs> so it's I mean it's not just that you know, you're in a space with people who have opinions, but these people are controlling you and they're controlling every single aspect of your life. When you eat, when you are able to like go outside, <laughs> you know, like it's, it's, you just lose everything. 
So once you have to experience all that and all those tiny little decisions again, it gets overwhelming. And mm -hmm. so then they're like, oh, there it is. See, told you, you were crazy. <laughs> cool, guys. Yeah. Yeah, I know. What about you? Any, uh, any talking points? Uh, one thing I want to talk about, um, when they went to get ice cream, the, uh, she said, like, the nurses put on this face, like, oh, this isn't happening right now. Uh, I'm not a nurse escorting around a bunch of lunatics getting ice cream. And, like, I think that's, that's basically something that just about everyone does nowadays. Like, they just put their head down, look at their cell phone, kind of ignore their surroundings put up like a digital shield to the outside world as opposed to dealing with the issues at hand. Like if I don't notice them, they don't notice me. Right. right. Don't make eye contact when we pass each other on the sidewalk and maybe you won't realize I exist. So I don't have to converse I do that with so many people from our graduating class. Do I do that? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. I'm like that person that I'll be walking down the street or, you know, walking into work and be like, hi, I don't know you, but I'm going to smile away, but you anyway. Yeah, random people are one thing, but other people that I graduated with, it's like... Yeah, people who, like, have this preconceived notion of who I am, I'm not yeah. interested. Like, don't... I don't want to talk to you. There's a reason that we're not friends. Yup. <laughs> like, we don't post, hang out for a reason. Post me on Facebook and leave me alone. Yep. Well, um, yeah, I thought it was... The, um, the ice cream thing was interesting, because it's like the nurses are trying to... First of all, they're trying to pretend like everything is okay when they're, like, walking as a shield around these people who are obviously <laughs> have, have problems. And right. They're trying to, like, set the tone for everyone else. Like, we'll just, like, I'll pretend this isn't happening. You behind the ice cream <laughs> parlor, you're going to pretend it's not happening. Just get their ice cream, and we're going to go. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, right. And I think, like, it happens in a lot of situations when you just can't control it like one of my little sisters would always throw tantrums in the store and that would be another like situation where I would just be like this isn't happening right now we're leaving slowly and quietly I don't care that you're screaming everyone else can just deal with it like <laughs> <laughs> well because when you have a screaming child on your hands there's no you can't you don't reason with them. That's like trying to reason with like a bird. You can't, it's not, they don't speak the same language. You're not on the same page at all, ever. <laughs> and well, in that way, they are being treated like misbehaving children. Yeah, because exactly. They're not even, they're not trying to like engage with them and be like, why are you doing that right now? It's right. not appropriate. <laughs> they're just like, <laughs> they're going to do what they're going to do, get the ice cream, go back, and we'll call it a day. <laughs> Even not engaging with them in that moment after after the whole incident is has happened or whatnot, you know, just sitting down with them and go, what what were you feeling to make you act that way, and how can we potentially prevent that in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really felt like there should have been a little bit more like interaction, like just. Like that, like, what's going on? Why did you feel that that was a necessary action for what was happening? Like, I felt like she did give snippets of her talking to doctors, but I wish that maybe a little bit more would have been, like, a day-to-day -day thing. Like, what happened after you got, your doctor got the report from how you behaved at Ice Cream Social? Yeah, I felt, that. sorry, yeah. Kevin, go ahead. That's kind of one thing that I would have liked a little bit more from the book is some depth into any of the subjects. I felt like she just sort of glossed over a little bit of everything, and she didn't really have any – there wasn't any real timeline to the book either. She sort of jumped from one event to the other. It sort of just seemed like she was writing it as it came to her head kind of deal. Which is, you know, what happened. Possible. Yeah, quite possible. I felt like it was kind of just a free-for-all, you know, like, okay, I'm in here, I'm supposed to be getting help, or, you know, you're, you're supposed to be helping me to either treat or, you know, whatever, this, this problem, but I kind of felt like it was, oh, okay, well, you're all, you're all in here, just have at it, go, go do you. Yeah. And there wasn't any 
I mean, other than their, you know, their assigned bedtime and their, their assigned, um, like food time, I didn't feel like there was any structure at all. Also, I just felt like it was. The only like structure was if you were too rambunctious, you went to the, the quiet room or whatever. Yeah. And, or they gave you Thorazine and they knocked you out. They're like, we're just not even dealing with this. Like, but like giving NyQuil to an infant. Like, what? <laughs> Why would you think that that's the way to fix that problem? That's not. Well, I think that this also comes from a different era or a different. Oh, yeah. This is outdated. It's, it's also like, because until very recently, just the philosophy on mental health issues is just like quarantine get them out. We don't want them here. If they're like bad enough to not be able to function in society, just put them in a place and let them do their thing because we can't help them. Right. Which they kind of touch on at the very end when she's re at the library reading about her diagnosis or whatever. And they're like, and she says that homosexuals used to be in that book as mm -hmm. like mentally ill-equipped basically <laughs> like but they just recently made their way out she's like well maybe i'll make my way out of the book too <laughs> like i don't know is she actually crazy yeah i mean she's just she, a person she has a personality disorder oh, right. where she just over analyzes everything and and they go into like yeah, a little like, bit of a breakdown where she's like no you start out thinking like okay the refrigerator's running and then it breaks down into, okay, the refrigerator's running, but what if it isn't? And then it breaks down into, like, like 20 different subcategories. Right. What would I do if it wasn't running? But it probably is. I could just go check. But really, what if, I, what if it's not? I should prepare for that. Well, yeah. How do I prepare for the refrigerator not being running? How do I do that? And then it's like, oh, here's scenario one for, for that pep preparation, but what if that fails? What if I need another one? And... It's literally just a big spiral staircase of one thing leads to another, leads to another, and then she gets distracted as to what she was thinking about initially, which was, is my refrigerator running? Like, which something it is. you or I would <laughs> think, yeah, let's get up and double check. Right. Well, that's part of the thing with the hand issue. Do you, do yeah. you guys remember that? Yeah, when um, she tries to rip her skin off? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, she, I just never got any tense. I was like, what's yeah. going on? He's like one biting into her hand. Moment. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. She's literally sitting there and she just goes, she's like, I don't think I have skin. And then she goes, how do I know that I have, or like, I know oh. I have skin, but what are, What if there's no bones underneath it? Like my hand's hard Your bones. and I can feel it. And she's like, but what if I, what if I don't? And she legitimately like just starts. Right. She's and, like, and they, take it. I have to know. They better yeah. be in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they, they wind up having to drug her because she yeah. is going ham on her hand. Like, yeah, she's I like, gotta know. What if, what if I'm not crazy? What if I'm another being and I don't have, I just don't have bones? I gotta find out. Like, the, like every possible scenario goes through her brain as she's munching on her hand. And then, like, the nurse comes in and is like, ha. Ah. She just, the nurse, the nurse's reaction, though. She wasn't surprised. She wasn't, she just like sighed and was like, oh, like I'll go get some Thorazine by. And then just like shoves it down her throat. <laughs> like, she's like, ah, that's what, I don't want it. And then she's like, no, just have it. <laughs> yeah, you're going to take this anyway. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like, Shh, it'll be over Shh. soon. Stop it. <laughs> yeah, I think, and that's, that's a lot of the thing that was happening back in those days was just like, manage the problem with drugs. Just subdue it. Right. Like, whatever's going on, just subdue it. Yep. Just make it stop at any means. Like like a caveman, like doesn't work. <laughs> work. No? And then do the same thing again. Like it's not helping anything. It's just keeping it contained. It, it, it was. It showed a lot of really interesting view viewpoints, even though it was only from Susanna Kaysen's viewpoint. Like you got to still see a little bit of like 
how the nurses would be like, and it, there were different kinds of nurses. There were like the shut up, sit down, leave me alone. And then there was the one that they really liked, um, Valerie. Yeah. And yeah, cause they complained to her about the other nurse that was just like, I'm going to shove medicine down all your throats to yeah. shut you up and not deal with you. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to see that there are, that there were, like, even at that time, people who did really want to help, but just weren't sure how because of how it was, I guess. Mm -hmm. One thing she did talk about, though, is that one of the few compassionate nurses that was there, they completely took advantage of yeah. and made her completely bitter by the end of her cycle there. Yeah. I liked them talking about the, the interns. Yeah. How they basically became, like, surrogate family members. Mm -hmm. And any issues that they were having in their real life, they were like, you know, oh, make sure you use protection, or hey, if you're feeling this right. way, make sure you talk to somebody, or, you know, things like that. And I it's thought that was kind of cool. That I feel like it was because that helped them feel in control a little bit when everything else in their life was so ruled by all of the people who worked in the facility, whereas these interns who came in who worked for the facility just spoke to them like people because they didn't know about their conditions really. They didn't really, they were just brand new baby med students. They don't know. They didn't necessarily judge them or look at them as crazy. Right. right. And I like how they said that they, during that time, they settled down, like all the, in, all the people in there, they, they settled down while the interns were there but then when they would leave, they would go all hell break loose again. And Which should be, you know, okay, well, we noticed this behavior as, yeah. you know, this instance was happening. Right, you need How to do we keep that? Something, like, to take care of. Clearly that helps. Yeah, they talk to them like people. Hmm, maybe we should give that a try. Right. They're, they're, they're not just bipolar, and they're not just dysfunctional, and not just schizophrenic. What? They're people? Things might have made them this way? No. <laughs> right. Nah. Well, that's also a, an occupational hazard, I will tell you, is um, therapists getting too attached to patients. So there does need to be some kind of distance there. And I think that as you become more experienced as a therapist, you be get better at handling that distance. Because I have had one or two therapists who got really personal in my life and like started to become like really close. And like it didn't like it just didn't work out because it, at a certain point they're getting emotional with me. And I'm like, this isn't helping. <laughs> right. like, yeah, it's like um, they they join your company. Like they, they come to where you are rather than like stay in their office with their books. And right, yeah, but some like professional. There needs to be some middle ground. Right. So like between the interns and the people that were working there, there needs to be like a meeting in the middle. Um, and I think that's the ideal place to be in where you have some professional distance, but you also want to like try and talk to someone, like you said, as if they're a person um, and, and relate to them on some like interpersonal level. Just be, just be polite to them. Like, I feel like that was one of the things just like make jokes with them, act like they, I don't want to keep calling them crazy because I don't feel like like all of them are. Right. But don't treat them like they're crazy. Don't look at them and go, oh, it's time for your medicine. Like, there's a have a conversation. Like, oh, hey, what book are you reading? Or, oh, hey, you know, did you notice it's sunny outside? Oh, right. you know, there, there's a way to right. be professional and distant but still polite rather than time for your Thorazine, babe. Let's do this. Right. Which, and then just cart them off to bed. Yeah. Unless they were being good sitting in the TV room, not doing anything, not chewing on their hands. Not chewing on their hands. And, oh, my God, the whole thing with Lisa when she goes crazy and was stealing toilet paper. 
Oh, I thought that was hilarious. That was funny. <laughs> Kevin, you wish you read this book. You really do, because we're just this throwing This like quite the roller coaster ride. I'm kind of sorry that I missed it. It's pretty, yeah. I will say. We got, like, hand ripping off, and now we're talking about stealing toilet paper. I mean. Well, there was a they do they, <laughs> I did the they, they, like, drugged her or something, and then to get back at them, she, she nonchala nonchalantly stole all kinds of toilet yeah. paper and stuff, and then, like, pranked them. She just acted like she had to pee a lot, and then nobody really bothered her because she was, like, a little bit scary, you know? Nobody really bothered her too much if she seemed too upset. So they were like, okay, she's in the TV room. Everybody leave her alone. Let her be her. Don't, her don't change the channel. Nothing. Right. Turns out she was toilet paper in the TV room. <laughs> like, Why? I did like the moment when uh, they all sort of realized that they weren't as crazy as they thought they were. When uh, they went to the maximum security ward and mm. went to that girl's cell and she had spread shit all over the walls and all over <laughs> yep. the and stuff. And they just stood in the doorway for a minute and were like, uh, well, it was nice to see you. We're going to go now. I like, <laughs> it was yeah, really, uh, the one that we were talking about having the like turf war. The one that stole all the toilet paper? It was the one that stole all the toilet paper against the she new girl named Lisa. It. Well, she didn't wind up in maximum security. This other chick winds up in maximum security, and they go to visit her, and just bed sheets, the bed, everything, the walls are just covered in her, her feces. Fucking just doom it. Herself, her hair, it's yeah. everywhere. Oh. Yeah. It's everywhere. <laughs> But basically, at that at max security, it's just a like a room the size of like a regular you know, bathroom with a sh with a mattress in it. No sheets, no pillow, no blanket, nothing. Like no. any person would go would lose their mind. Like they would go bananas if you had okay. absolutely nothing. To but do I wouldn't ever. be smearing my shit. I'm sorry, that is disgusting. Oh, no. that I mean, sounds like a pretty <laughs> shitty situation. I mean, right? But if you're already off your rocker a bit. I made a point. And then they lock you in a room with absolutely nothing to occupy your brain space. You're gonna need a right. Don't make shit in crayons. Like, come on now. Listen, <laughs> sometimes I don't know. I I feel like I I can't put myself in that position to know if I would or I wouldn't. Just pick up a turd and be like, I, I should I know. put this in my hair. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not not even in my darkest, most Tell me I'm pretty. horrendous <laughs> OCD moments would uh. I ever consider picking up my own turd. <laughs> I can't do it. Yeah. I just, I but just not. Like where she was and like OCD are very different ends of the <laughs> spectrum. Very, very different. Yours is have, you, have you dealt with Extreme OCD to the point of. I'm so Ow! Sorry. Sorry. Ow. To the point of nausea and vomiting and anxiety attacks so bad you're literally laying in a ball crying because you think you're batshit nuts. Because you cannot understand why one thing, and there's no exaggeration, why one thing cannot be put into a place because there's something else there. I mean, it's, it's yeah. literally, you freeze. You don't, I, yeah, I, no, I, I don't I, have a word for it. It's, I get it. it. It's that I get it. Things, uh, things run in my family. It's pretty hereditary. I've been in a lot of situations myself. So yeah, no, I totally get what you're saying. Something that seems completely rational to any other person is the end of your world in that exact moment. It might not have been the end of your world last week. But or today it is. Tomorrow. But yeah, but today, why is that movie not where it needs to be in the alphabetical order? Why? Why would somebody, they're very clearly in alphabetical order. Why? Why would you not do that? Why would you not? Like, or and then you hold me. All of oh, my books are alphabetized why? by authors last night. Every, Every single, single one, one of them. them. I just and and, and then they're, they're in order series-wise series wise with the actual <laughs> author. So like right. triple or quadruple, quadruple in order. order. And he'll go through. You've got an extra. 
We have an echo. Hmm? How do we have an echo? I don't know. I don't hear an echo. Now it's gone. <laughs> oh, now it's gone. No, we did, though. But echo! Oh, so no. no echo. I think there's an echo for a second while, while it transitions between cameras. Hmm. The yeah. speakers from the person's camera who's on pick up your talking, and it goes on to their mic while you're talking through yours. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, so, it's fixed now. Let me just move the ball a little bit there. So, how did everyone overall, I guess, like it? Like, how would we... I feel like it was a quick, easy read. I would rate it... I, it wasn't greatly written. So, but I mean, like, you can't ask really that of what it is. Um... But overall, I would give it three and a half stars. Yeah, I would. I would. I was gonna say the same thing. Three and a half stars because it was. It wasn't just mediocre. It was just a, it, like I don't know. Three is like the middle. I guess mediocre is not the correct word, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> medium, the medium of the good. <laughs> medium good. <laughs> I got it. Just above medium good. <laughs> I I Goodreads rated it at two, but I'm seriously considering bumping it up to three. So I, I would give it a three. Okay. What about you? Three point five. Bam. Kevin, what did uh what did you rate it? Yeah, Kevin. Tell yeah, Kevin. Indulge us, please, on your thoughts. Because yeah, I don't think you told everybody, um <sighs> oh. how, how good was it? It's Did a very solid it? book. I give it a two and a half star rating um. because I haven't <laughs> read it yet. But just based off of the shit spewing and the craziness and the ice cream getting and the shitty nurses, I, I am going to read it if I, or soon. I just, real life got in the way of this one and I didn't get a chance to pick it up. I, I mean, I apologies. I get it. I took a really long time to read the last book, but just because life. You know, three-year-old doesn't let you read all the time, turns out. Weird. <laughs> but, I don't know, did we hit on everything everybody felt was important? Oh, hold on one second. Oh, okay, well. I, I had one more sticky note. All right, let's do this. Um, one thing I want to talk about while you're looking for that real quick is, did anyone else feel like she really glorified the ability to commit suicide at the beginning of the book? Yes. She's like, oh, yeah. it takes such bravery to pull the trigger and blah, right. blah, blah. Like, like it's a courageous act. Right. I mean, it goes against all of your human instincts for survival, which is why I think that when someone does commit suicide, it has to be it's, – it's never a choice that someone makes. It's never – that's right. why I don't feel like it's courageous because it's not any one of those things. It's just your illness. Right. You feel that that is, ex that is what has to happen for right. the it's, world to continue on. It's just the illness. It's just whatever mental illness that you're experiencing, that's a symptom of it. If you look at it as any other illness, that's what makes certain mental illnesses deadly. It's not because you're going to waste away or you're going to, like, have... Your heart's like, going to grow. ...or something, you know. It's, it's just that um, with this spectrum of mental illnesses, there is the grave possibility that you can be in a state where you decide to take your life and by deciding I don't mean that it's a decision like you're sitting back and thinking like I think I'll pull the trigger now it's something that you really can't control as much as you can't control like right you're still <laughs> back with yourself down to that very last nanosecond like it's it's a constant it never ends but in but I think in the end they are what like it's like I said like that's what has to happen that's it Right. Like, I did like how she described her experience with taking all the aspirins, though. And like, then she realized, hey, mom asked me to get milk. I have done this. Mm -hmm. Like, 
She's like, oh, this is a very real thing that I have just done to myself. And then she's like, I'm going to go outside so someone will find me and maybe I won't die. Well, like, no, she she was like, oh, mom asked me to pick up milk. I guess I better do that so she doesn't get mad when I'm gone. And I was like. Yeah, which is another symptom, like, of the illness. Like, she wasn't thinking about how her mom would feel emotionally about her being gone forever. <laughs> she was thinking, thinking about, about not her having mom milk. being upset about the milk. Like, yeah. She thinks that her existence isn't as important as something as making sure there's milk in the fridge at that, at that point in time. When you're so mm -hmm. deep into that illness that even your human instinct of, to survive cannot save you from it. Yeah. That's the level of illness that you have to be in to make, you know, to do that to yourself. See, I was, I guess, kind of thrown by the fact that she talked about it so cavalierly. It was just, yeah, sometimes I'm walking down the street and, you know, I'm thinking, God, that bird's really annoying. I should kill myself. And I can't say that I ever had an extended period where that's what I would have considered. Mm -hmm. And for me to just be like, like, I've never just walked down the street and went, damn, that car horn is just, oh, my God, it's driving me nuts. I, you know. I should just end it. I should just, yeah. Hear it. Well, that's what. So, I was I like, I, I don't under, like, is that really what it's like? Because I've never. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a name for that, too. It's it's actually a component. It's, it's not OCD, but it is OCD-like in that it's constant thoughts that you can't control. Um, and when those thoughts align with suicidal tendencies, so you can have those thoughts and not be anywhere near actually wanting to or feeling like you will actually commit suicide. It's just the thoughts would be running in your brain. Yeah. Like you're um, like you're driving down the road and then yeah. like, I could die if that semi hit me right now. Right. And just continue on. Like, you're not affected by the thought, really. You're just like, my, my life could be over right now. But the, the real dangerous thing is that when those recurring thoughts match up with the impetus to actually go through with it, that's when that becomes really super dangerous. So it's All called right. suicidal ideation. Yeah. All right, Aaron, what was your thing you wanted to talk about before? Um, oh, yeah, did I read that right? <laughs> Oh, I guess. Um, the end, where she winds up kind of seeing this guy or whatever. Yeah. And I I have written, oh, someone wants to marry her. Let's let her out. Right. I, I didn't understand. That's She's okay. your problem now. <laughs> I, mean, I was just going to say, was it, was it like that? Where it's like, oh, someone else is going to, you know, assume responsibility for her. So we don't have to. Well, I think what it is is her parents, before she's married, is who was paying her way to li live there. Like she said, back in the day, it was like 60-some dollars a day. And back in 1968, that was a lot of money. Like, a lot of money. And now, if she's going to be married to this human, this other human, her parents are like, well... Like, okay, uh, but like, then I have the question like, with giving her away like a dow, not like a dowry, not not like that, but like, yeah, I guess symbolic of like giving her away at a wedding. Like, well, well here you go, you get all her medical stuff, you buy. <laughs> and then I guess my question is, how did her parents just let her get committed? Like, I mean, she, I mean, she tried 15 to kill minutes, her. Christine. Fifteen <laughs> minutes, and this dude decided. She's crazy. Well, I'm going to check her in. They or I'm going to trick her into checking herself in. So. They did try and commit suicide. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but that was... Like, we don't know how to deal with that at all. So. <laughs> well, yeah, but that was also before, you know, like she had been going to, to another therapy or whatever she said. And, you know, she had had gotten a job and had gotten, found coping mechanisms and things like that. Um... So I guess I was just kind of like, 
okay, let's and again, that's that's coming from our time period and the pro the progress we've made and the things that we know now. So like, but back then, people were like, "Oh my gosh, you kissed a girl, <gasps> burn her." You know what I mean? Like they don't. It wasn't. The fact that she tried to kill herself way, way back then was a very outrageous notion. Like, they could not possibly have understood to any capacity where she was at. Like, they were ill-equipped, really. At that point, anything you say, after you're someone who's commit tried to commit suicide, no one is going to take you seriously. Yeah, your word isn't credible anymore. Because you didn't even take breathing seriously so <laughs> yeah so so at that point her parents were probably more focused on talking to the doctors and respecting the doctor's wishes than they were with respecting her wishes because that's the person that is has become the authority on their daughter See, I took it as more of a, okay, let's just push her out of the house now. We don't want to yeah. deal with her. Which is probably how she felt about it. The way I thought it made it sound, though, like, she she was still going about her day. Like, this was just a normal doctor checkup for her. Like, it wasn't mm -hmm. planned at all that she was going to be institutionalized. She was just going in for, like, a routine, oh, well, I have to go get a checkup now. And the doctor just sort of pushed her out the door into the taxi, and she didn't really have, like, she didn't have an opportunity to be like, hey, mom, dad, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be institutionalized. Like, she went straight from the doctor to the hospital. And then got checked in. Like, he tricked her into checking herself in. Which, back then, a person in that kind of a place is very easy, like, in his position, it was very easy. He was a doctor. He went to school. He did all the things. She's just a person who tried to kill herself. Why would we think that she's correct? Like, like the part why it was so great when she proved, you know, no, I was there for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I have proof. I'm, I'm not as crazy as you guys all think. Yeah. Right. Right. It was a it was a really interesting book, and it definitely in, intrigued the reader. I feel like it really, even if you, it, no matter what, it triggered something for all of us. It seems, I, which I think is kind of the point of a book, right? To hit you somewhere. <laughs> like, I liked that it was something I wouldn't read. I liked that I was able to branch out from what I guess the norm is for me. Right. So I really appreciated that. Thank you. You're welcome. Look forward to more. <laughs> All right. So I say that we rate it somewhere between a three and a 3.5. Let's say 3.25 right in the middle. Nice, happy. Well, the three of you guys went three and a half. I have no problem rating it, you know, putting it at, at a three and a half. I, think my only holdback well, was that it's not... Two, so... Yeah, he didn't Lord read it. He count. doesn't count. <laughs> I know. I was just... Um, <laughs> my only holdback was I think I was more looking forward to more of a, a scientific aspect than, right. you know, trying to prove, I guess, her innocence. Right. So I... I, I liked it. It wasn't bad. Mm. I just... It was good. I don't, I don't mind doing 3.5. Yeah. Oh. So what about so I say overall we rate it that three point five then? Yeah? Yeah. All right. Three point five. Woo! Thank Woo. you. Anna Kaysen, your book was a wonderful read. We all enjoyed it to some extent, I feel. Um so yeah. Great times. Let's go on to our choices for the next book. Okay, how how do you want to do that? Drum rolls. <laughs> Oh. How do you want to end up deciding? Like that's what we never. Are we doing the random number thing again, or I see, we can do the random number thing yeah. again. Oh, I feel like that works. That works. Um, here, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got it. I got it right here. My oh. fucking. Oh, okay. Where my video on? notepad is right here. You getting all sassy? I hate this notepad. Need this right. thing. Kevin, did you want to change your choice, or? Uh, these are my notes. 
I, I'm writing so down write their down choices. Every time I die. Sorry, here. Which is a lot. It's a lot. Don't don't fuck that one up. Please don't fuck the Overwatch one up. This one? No, the well, I was one on just gonna page. write on the That's back fine. of this. Okay, Kevin, what was your choice? I'm gonna do the Andromeda strain. Nice. And the graveyard book. By Neil Gaiman! Woo -woo. Can you tell he's my favorite author? Hey, if you're out there, I want to be your friend. <laughs> the graveyard book, you said? Yeah. You changed my life, Neil Gaiman. I love you. I can honestly say I've never read anything by him. Oh my gosh! You've never read a Neil Gaiman book? I've never read a Neil Gaiman book. I'm, like, I'm telling you. They're fantastic. Lila. They're Changed my entire state of thought on everything that exists. I, he's a magnificent, amazing author. I can't express that enough. My choices, Sam. Your yes. choices. Okay. Uh, my first choice is Brilliance by Marcus Seiki. Brilliance. Brilliance. And my next choice. <laughs> Is wool? Wool, is wool, wool. The Wool Trilogy series by Hugh Howie, Kevin. That's not fair. Woo! Woo! That's, that's a trilogy. We only have to read one, right? It's the same length as an original, like a normal book, so we have to read all three. Okay, well, since you wrote them down randomly, let's go Woo! as I knock the book off the desk. I have to go here. Give us one second. He's pulling I'm it off. I'm doing the thingy. Made a number generator. Well, Christine actually has to pick the number of how many times we press the. Oh, I do. I don't know. This, I think we let. You hit remember. it five times last time. Before. No, I thought I asked somebody for oh, a yeah, number. Too much pressure. I can't make that decision. <laughs> um. Yeah, I got. Yeah, I don't know what. Ah, uh, seven or nine. Hang on. Oh, God. Those are both very, very good numbers because I hate even numbers. Oh, I was going to pick eight first, but then I, okay. I, the even number thing did it. I was like, you yeah. have to pick. What's up with this random orgy I'm seeing here? <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, you don't want to see those tabs that I could open. Nine. Oh, no. Uh, she chose nine, so you have to click it nine times. Here. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh my god, my book's not even in there. I'm stressed. <laughs> Nine. Two. A lot of fours book two is the graveyard book. Woo, woo, woo. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, hold on, we have to switch it so you guys can see that I didn't cheat. There we go. Hold it up. It is the graveyard book. Okay, let's do it. So, Kevin's choice wins. <laughs> Lila, you realize that this next time, like Fuck. you can put wool in Fuck both Kevin times. Fucking wool. Fuck. Oh, okay. Yes. Or, or we'll you can choose wool between the two. <laughs> Since you're the only one yeah, that's left yeah, to win, you really can, get you can just whatever book you wanted at all. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> <what I heard. laughs> oh, He's, stop it, Kevin. Oh, hold on one second. Let me uh, hold this. Oh, hang on. Up. Kevin didn't see my sweet shirt. Hold on. There we go. How do oh, I have a sweet sweet shirt? Nice. Please, please. Oh, see, he knows what it was. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pull up the synopsis for the graveyard book. You don't have to sign in. Just look it up. Holy long have... fucking password, Batman. Jesus Christ. Listen, nobody's breaking into her Goodreads. <laughs> no shit. Like, it's not even like a bank account. She's like, Goodreads. <laughs> Retinal scan. Okay. Okay, so how do we do this again? Oh, um, yeah. Click the green thing over here. I love that everybody can see me that I'm pointing off in the distance. And then just click that one, Goodreads. No. And then I did <laughs> click it. 
I see you. I see you, Lila. <laughs> okay. Well, that is oh, our... Hey. Sorry. <laughs> that is the next book chosen by Kevin. Would you like to read the synopsis for everybody that's listening? And slash or watching? I don't know. I don't think anybody is. Yeah, can you... Uh... After the grisly murder of his entire family, a toddler wanders into a graveyard where the ghosts and other supernatural residents agree to raise him as one of their own. Nobody Owens, known to his friends as Bod, is a normal boy. He would be completely normal if he didn't live in a sprawling graveyard being raised and educated by ghosts with a solitary guardian who belongs to neither the world of the living nor the dead. There are dangers and adventures in the graveyard for a a boy, but if Bod leaves the graveyard, then he will come under attack from the man named Jack. I'm sorry, this is really hard to read. It's very small. <laughs> so she said, who has already killed Bod's family? Beloved master storyteller Neil Gaiman returns with a luminous new novel for the audience that embraced his New York Times best-selling modern classic, Coraline. Magical, terrifying, and filled with breathtaking adventure, the Graveyard Book is sure to enthrall readers of all ages. Bless. Woo! Yes! Neil Gaiman! Uh, click the stop sharing button. Click yeah. stop up well, here. Right here. Up where? No, no, you hit it. Stop. I don't touch anything. Stop it. Put the mouse yeah. down. He wrote lots of good books. He wrote Coraline and Stardust and Neverwhere and all kinds of good things. So I'm really excited. I haven't read this one yet. Pretty jazzed. I was going to put in Stardust, but I was reading that there was a lot of uh, graphic sexual stuff in there, and I'm really big in that. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, let's, well, let's go on. I don't care. Let's run a smut club. Ha ha ha. As long as you don't Why have to not? <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't force that book on anybody. Guys. <laughs> what? No! Stop. Oh, stop opening your mouth! <laughs> I thought she was having a nosebleed. I was like, "Oh my god, Aaron! <laughs> oh my god, take it off!" <laughs> Are we still online? Yes. Yeah. Yes. This line. Oh, okay. Well. Oh my god, oh. guys! <laughs> Thank you all for what? Are you doing? <laughs> Yes, thank you all for coming. <laughs> I hope whoever watches this had a really great time with our shenanigans. Uh, I told you, I, I watched it. Okay, stop. I I'm trying it. to finish this up. Sunglasses. The squirrel's quiet. Okay. <laughs> yes, I got rid of it. Thank everybody for, for watching us. Um, join us. In probably two or three weeks for um, the Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. Um, it's this thing. Oh. Um, we had a wonderful time discussing this book, so Christine, thank you so very much for choosing it. Um, remember, it's okay to be book curious. <laughs>